Seeing is believing. Dramatic Evidence of a Creator God by George E. Vandeman. 1989. Chapter 2 Plant Prodigies. Exploring the local park or forest, most of us see only a mass of green, an assortment of nondescript leaves and branches spread before us. Little do we dream on our Sunday afternoon strolls that we are unwitting witnesses to architectural feats, chemical marvels, innovative aviation, and complex data processing. It's right here if we only look closely enough. Most of us use plants simply to grace our living rooms, add color to our porches, freshen up our offices. They're nice to have around, of course, nice to have in the background, but we don't notice them that much. We don't notice, for example, how much is involved in what appears to be a simple common thing, a plant turning toward the light. We just kind of expect them to. They turn toward the light naturally. They're attracted to it. Plants need sunlight to stay healthy, to grow. But how do they do it? And how do they manage that technological feat of turning light directly into energy? To get inside plant life, let's first take a look up at the sky, up at a satellite orbiting the Earth. Its measuring devices and transmitters operate on solar batteries. These cells convert sunlight into electricity, small amounts of it anyway, much like a photographic exposure meter does. Now, this satellite revolving and orbiting through space won't always face the sun at the proper angle. In fact, its solar batteries would lie inactive in shadow much of the time. To avoid that, space scientists have developed a very complex tracking system. It measures the direction of the sun's beams and then, by means of control motors, moves the solar panel to face the sun's rays for maximum exposure. All this involves very complex processes measuring the angle of light rays, interpreting the data logically, executing precise movements. The sun sensors, the computing system, the circuitry, and the control motors occupy considerable space in the satellite. Getting a solar battery to turn toward the light is no simple task, but all around us, plants are solving this intricate problem every day. And in many ways, their technology is superior to ours. Yes, superior to the ingenuity of NASA's most brilliant scientists. Much of the information shared in this chapter is based on a study of plants by science writer Felix Paturi. He called his work Nature, Mother of Invention. In this chapter, we're going to see just how incredibly inventive Mother Nature is by looking at plant prodigies. Plants are masters of what is called phototropism, the movement of plants when stimulated by light. They pack all the necessary mechanics, the means of measuring, interpreting, and moving into one compact unit, and that's incredibly sensitive. A plant kept in the dark for a day will react to a single flash of light two thousandth of a second long. In a tree or bush, individual leaves bend and turn so that as few as possible are overshadowed and all take an adequate radiation. Plants have solved an energy problem that still plagues our industrialized world, and they've done it on a large scale. They use energy efficiently and without hazardous wastes. Think about it. Plants have been producing refuse for thousands of years far longer than factories, but they dispose of wastes without pollution. Their wastes are broken down in the soil to become food again. Production and decomposition cancel each other out. Everything is recycled. Such a well-balanced system can go on functioning indefinitely. Sun power makes roses red, violets blue, and ferns green. Is it any wonder the psalmist was moved to write in praise of Jehovah? He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for man to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. 
Psalm 104, verse 14. The psalmist saw a wise creator in the wonder of growing things. How much more should we see that now? Sunlight is a vital part of the miracle, and so is water. Let's look at how plants absorb it. Say you live in an apartment on the sixth floor, about 60 feet from the ground. And let's say you and your family use 40 gallons of water a day. It takes an extensive pipe system and a lot of pressure to pump those 40 gallons 60 feet up in the air. That's one reason you get those nice little bills every month. But did you realize that a full grown birch tree does that much work on a hot summer day? It gets 40 gallons up to its branches and leaves every day without electricity or gas or power pump. In fact, the tree itself needs supply, no energy to do this. Everything is automatic. When water evaporates from the leaves, it creates a constant compensating suction of water below. The suction continues through twigs, branches, and trunk down to the roots. This happens because the tree's water pipes are actually many, many microscopic tubes. No man-made suction pump has ever managed to pull water up more than 30 feet. Columns of water suctioned higher than this in ordinary pipes inevitably collapse. But the tallest of trees are able to suction up water to their uppermost branches because of their capillaries, tiny tubes a few thousandth of a millimeter in diameter. How true these words ring from Psalm 104, verse 16. The trees of the Lord are well watered, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. The trees that he planted, indeed, how ingeniously they are watered. But there's much more to plant technology and engineering. Did you know that plants are also extraordinary architects? In the 1850s, architect Sir Joseph Paxton entered a competition to design the building that would house London's World Exhibition. He longed to outdo his rivals with an epic-making design. Paxton conjured up a building of gigantic dimensions which would have nothing heavy or clumsy about it. He imagined a structure that would produce the effect of lightness, even weightlessness. But the problem was there was no way to construct such a building at the time. Large structures required massive walls to support them. There seemed no way to create the graceful, airy building Paxton had in mind. But then he remembered a certain plant he'd worked with as a gardener in his youth, the royal water lily. The floating leaves of this lily are huge, up to six feet in diameter and very thin. But in spite of this, they're quite stable. They achieve this stability by a complicated strutting on the underside. Ribs radiate from the center of the leaf outward, splitting up into many branches. The royal water lily gave Paxton the key to making his architectural dream come true. He used a few main struts connected by many small ribs in his design, and he won the competition. The result, the Crystal Palace of the World Exhibition, a smashing success. It proved to be a great turning point in architecture. The bold skyscrapers of steel and glass we see all around us today actually date back to that graceful, airy Crystal Palace. And yes, back to the remarkable design of the royal water lily. Plants have also mastered the art and science of aviation, and they did it long before Orville and Wilbur Wright propelled their frail craft into the air. We see this most often in the way seeds navigate to suitable soil. If a tree dropped its seeds straight down, the seedlings would have to try to grow in the shade of the parent tree and would soon choke each other out. Seeds need to be transported away from the parent tree or plant, and this is accomplished in a variety of ways. The common dandelion sends its seeds aloft by means of tiny parachutes. 
First, the plant actually measures relative humidity, temperature, and wind velocity. It will, re will release its seeds only when conditions are just right. A steady wind must be blowing, not just a brief gust. The air must be warm and dry, indicating that rising wind currents will prevail. Only then do the flying seeds let go and venture on their all-important journey. And these dandelion seeds, hanging under their parachutes like so many paratroopers, are able to travel remarkable distances. Several other plants also transport seeds by means of parachutes. And what's very interesting is that these plants come from a widely different botanical families. They are not confined to one species or genus. They are not one type of plant. Now this presents a real problem for the theory of revolution. Evolution. It is one thing to assume that one plant group managed to evolve this ingenious parachute solution to the problem of seed transportation. That is in itself taking a lot of faith. But to believe that a whole range of different plant types all develop the same amazing way is a solution to a common challenge and it takes more faith than I could ever muster. I hope you are beginning to see that behind all the ingenuity of plants solving technical problems lies one common denominator, one common source, an ingenious creator. From parachutes, we move to gliders. The most interesting example is probably the winged seed of the tropical liana that grows high up in the branches of its parent tree amid beautiful shining green leaves. The liana seed develops two curved wings, transparent, gleaming, and very elastic. When the seed releases from the tree, it glides away in the breeze. Coldly objective scientists grow eloquent when observing this bit of plant aeronautics. One professor described the liana glider in this way, circling widely and gracefully, rocking to and fro, the seed sinks slowly, almost unwillingly to the earth. It needs only a breath of wind to make it rival the butterflies in flight. Early aviation pioneers were also impressed with the perfect flight of the liana seed. In building craft light enough to soar in the wind, stability was the key. Early flying machines kept falling apart, but the liana glider's gossamer wings were remarkably stable. And so two flying pioneers, Ettrick and Wells, made use of the liana seed in designing a tailless glider. The craft that resulted in 1904 proved to be a milestone in aviation history, gliding for about 900 meters. Another technological marvel pointing to nature as the mother of invention. Well, we've seen parachutes and gliders in the plant world. How about helicopters? The Norway maple seed is one example. It comes equipped with tiny curving wings. When the seed falls from the tree, air friction causes it to rotate quickly. It spins in a spiral path around the nut at its base. The effect is exactly the same as that produced by spinning helicopter blades. The rotation creates a complete circular surface which the wind can grip. And so, of course, the seed falls much more slowly and the tiniest bit of wind can push it more than 100 yards. Aeronautics, who would have thought that the trees would lead the way? Who can fathom the creative mind behind it all? Think for a moment of a mainframe computer, one of the truly great feats of modern technology. Its ability to store and retrieve data and to compute and sort and list is mind boggling. Computers perform functions in a split second that would take mathematicians weeks or even months. These machines are real problem solvers.
Electronic computers are also getting smaller and faster almost every day. Microelectronics <clears throat> continues to develop tinier and more efficient chips and circuits. But as impressive as computer number crunching is, <clears throat> there's something even more impressive that I can hold in the palm of my hand. <clears throat> a tiny marble that rivals all the information processing that a room full of computers can do. What is it? A common ordinary seed. Now some of you may be saying, wait a minute, I know seeds grow into flowers and trees, but doing the work of a computer, isn't that taking it a bit far? Well, let's think about it. A single plant seed must contain all the plant specifications. All the information about its appearance and behavior has to be stored right in one seed. The size and shape and color of the plant, its reactions in heat and cold, light and shade, drought and downpour, all must be determined beforehand in the seed. Now, how many megabytes would be taken up in a computer just to program the color of a plant's flower? Or, say, to mathematically encode just the outward form of a tree? Think about programming in the exact geometric shape of leaves, buds, blossoms, fruit, barks, stems. We're getting into millions and millions of digital notations. Think about trying to program the chemical qualities of the cell sap, the disposition of various types of tissue. And then try to figure out how to instruct the plant about survival techniques in various environments. How would you program in the remarkable range of adaptations we've talked about today? Well, science fiction writer Felix Paturi, for one, concluded that the storage capacity of a large modern computer would scarcely suffice for all this data. But it's all here. All that information and more is stored in each tiny seed. Incredible computer. Do you want to look at the far horizon of high technology? You don't have to go to Silicon Valley. You don't have to go to MIT. Just dig up a seed burrowing into the ground. Here's information processing at its most mind-boggling. Here is solid evidence for an infinitely wise creator. I can't believe a seed is the product of natural selection or genetic mutation. Weak animals can be weeded out by natural selection. Genetic mutation can produce a few freaks now and then. But those blind processes don't invent computers this size. I'm sorry, that just isn't done. If we can't see an incredibly ingenious god behind plant aviation and architecture and chemistry and the seed computer, then something's wrong with our eyesight. Our creator has solved a vast array of technical problems. He's created solutions that have inspired our greatest inventions. There's no question in my mind. God is a problem solver. He can solve any kind of problem. In the book of Hebrews, Jesus is described as the one who is able to save to the utmost, that is saved completely, perfectly, for all time. That's the kind of confidence we can have in the one who causes plants everywhere to turn surely towards the light and bloom and bear fruit in those nurturing rays. Perhaps you've been deeply wounded. Perhaps you're bearing scars from traumas in the past or are nursing a very present bitter hurt. There is a problem solver ready to help the broken. Psalm 147 verse 3 says of him with simple eloquence. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Yes, that great creator of the royal water lily, that architect of plant life, can be relied on to support us in our hour of need. He can build us up according to his ingenious blueprint. Sometimes we may feel perplexed and lost. We need help in making important decisions. We can't always see very far down the road when faced with alternative paths. And sometimes 
There are just too many choices, too many voices clamoring for our attention and allegiance. We need clear direction. We need a sure guiding hand. And the problem solver comes to us and declares, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Psalm 32 verse 8. That's a great assurance to have, isn't it? Coming from the one who sends maple and liana seeds off on their voyages, gliding, parachuting, helicoptering to a rendezvous with good soil. Certainly, this creator can be relied on to propel us in the right direction. He is a master of working good out of evil. Let me show you one promise about this problem solver found in Romans 8, verse 28. This is from the Amplified Bible. It says, We are assured and know that God, being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good to those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. All things, all the things that happen to us are fitting into a plan for good. God is the ingenious problem solver. He makes all things work together for good. That's good news. That's the good news that is echoed in flying seed and strutted leaf and flower turning surely toward the light. God's creative powers are everywhere in evidence. And they all shout, God can handle your problems. He can deal with your challenges. He is able. His wisdom is wide enough. His strength is deep enough. 